Everybody, we're back with another episode of Midnight on Earth. I'm your host, Jake Weaver, and we're here to give you more light, more love, and more knowledge. I switch it up every time. I just want to keep it fresh. We're trying new things out. We're evolving. It's, it's a really great thing. Today on the show, we have an incredible guest, an incredible guest, Nico Luminous, incredible musician. He's been around for a really long time. We're going to talk about a bunch of really incredible things. But first, before we drop in with Mr. Nico Luminous, I need you all to do a few things for me. I need you to follow me on Instagram at midnight underscore on underscore earth. That's the address. Go there. Find me. Follow me. The more people that follow this podcast, the bigger it's going to get. The more all this incredible information is going to get out there to all you incredible people. So do that for me. Go to Spotify. Follow me there. Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to your podcasts, please hit the button that connects you with me forever. And the most important thing, tell a friend. Tell a friend, tell people you know that love podcasts, that love these type of conversations, this information, this really cool stuff. Tell those people to check us out. We're here waiting for them. We're waiting for you to do that for us. Midnightonearth.com. Okay. So now that that's all out of the way, I'd like to introduce you to a very good friend of mine. His name is Mr. Nico Luminous. I'm going to read a bio that we have for him. Los Angeles-based artist and producer, Nico Luminous, is a man on a musical mission. His styles range from psychedelic chill trap to melodic hip-hop and club bangers. His unique take on bass music and EDM has landed him performances at Coachella, Lightning in a Bottle, Shambhala Music Festival, and many more, many, many more. His intelligently sampled melodies and thumpy bass lines capture Dan Floors in a sensual pulse that is simultaneously high energy and laid back. Glitchadelic soul womp is his signature flavor and it's drenched in the sounds of Caribbean R&B and hip hop. Hello, Nico. Thank you so much for joining us today. What up, buddy? How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing very well. How was that bio that, that was cultivated from a few places around the internet? Nice. No, sounds legit. Those, those are my flavors. <laughs> Is those there anything shows. you want to add to that? Or No, I mean, that's it, man. It's like, <clears throat> I feel like I've been making music for so long. I just love trying out so many different things. So um, that, that works, man. Everything taps into the Caribbean vibes because I grew up loving reggae, hip hop, and then, you know, the EDM thing came later. But that's kind of where, like, my, when I started playing shows and doing bigger gigs, was more DJing, playing well, electronic. I would music. like, yeah, yeah, I would like to add, though, that you've also been a big part of the West Coast underground culture in general for close to 25 years at this point. You've been there with us, all of us that have been going to festivals, going to concerts, making that a part of our life, places like Burning Man. You've been there with us, hanging out for decades, mm-hmm. and you've interacted with and inspired and enlightened so many people over that time. That's also That's a huge awesome. part of who you are. Yeah, just loving festivals, loving good people, loving that good energy. And then, you know, the music is obviously a huge counterpart to all that. So, yeah, well, we're going to talk. I had to get in the mix, had to get in the mix with my own sounds, right? Yeah, well, we're going to talk about the magic of music, how music affects people. We're going to tap into so many things 
the philosophy of music, the spirituality behind music, all this epic stuff. But so we're going to nice. break it all down, but we're going to start with you and your interest in music in general. At what point did you feel called to music in such a way that you were going to start learning how to perform? Um, <clears throat> man, if you ask my parents, I've been making music, banging on pots and pans with forks and spoons since I was, you know, seven, eight years old. So I've always just wanted to create music. It's always just been a part of like who I am. And, uh, I started performing at a pretty young age. I had my first band in like sixth grade. I was a drummer. It was a, rock, it was a heavy metal band. We called ourselves Millennium. And, uh, <clears throat> that was my first band. So we were probably playing, you know, little birthday parties and stuff. And I was in sixth and seventh grade. And that was, uh, you know, what, 1990, 91. What did you so do I, in that band in sixth grade? I mean, in sixth grade, I was watching cartoons and, and trying to steal nice. candy, kind of. You know, I was kind of interested in I mean, I was doing girls. those things. I was kind yeah, of was interested in well. <laughs> But I wasn't there yet. I was not in a band. I probably would have got the girls had I been in the band. What did you do in that band? Uh, I was in the band. I definitely wasn't getting any girls, but uh, I was the drummer. I played drums. Epic. No way. <laughs> somehow I didn't know that about your life story. Okay. So then you're in sixth grade, you're, you're playing drums, but so now you're like, wow, I really want to do this. Is that a point where you were like, okay, this is a path I want to take in life. I want to like keep playing live music. I want to figure yeah, out. Yeah. That's how to all I've ever band. wanted to do when I was young. It's only until recently where I was like, Hey, I, I think I want to do other stuff, but uh, my whole life, that's all I've ever wanted to do. Single focused on okay. that. So yeah. then from, I guess Locking let's just for people. Let's just kind of parlay from sixth grade <laughs> into your next stage of a band that was actually functional. Where, what, what was that for you? Um, <clears throat> I had a more legit band when it was like in high school. It was like a, you know, junior. So I was probably like 15 or 16. And I switched by then time I wanted to be the front man. So I was like singing and playing bass. Super into Primus, Bootsy Collins, like funk. And that stuff was super psychedelic. I was always into like sounds that were trippier as opposed to sounds that were just a little more straightforward and, and mainstream. So yeah, that was like a few, you know, I mean, it's funny because when you're 12 to your 15, that's like this eternity of time. You know, you look back on that now, it's like, oh, it's three years later or whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's like an ocean <laughs> but, uh, of life. You're just like, oh God, so much development. Well, we perceive time differently, I think, when we're younger. It could be a bar, you know, people say it's because of the ratio of how long we've lived to the amount of time. Exactly. But it, it's a it bigger could, fraction of your life at that sure, point. Sure. But it, it could also be something different as well. Where literally when we're younger, we perceive time differently. We experience time differently. I don't know how that works, but that definitely, I definitely can relate to that. 12 to 15. That's yeah, like that chance. The rapper song he said back when summers would last forever, you know, uh -huh. and it's just like, Jesus. Yeah, they would. I know. Yeah. Now it's like five minutes. You're like, wait, did summer oh, just go God. by? <laughs> yeah. Oh man. It's amazing. So, so all that being said, yeah, I, I just transformed into like what I was, uh, I always loved, like as a kid, I loved metal and heavy metal and stuff. That was just what had the most energy. I always loved hip hop. Like, I mean, I was young, so there was, there was run DMC. My cousins loved B big daddy Kane. And I was like, Oh, this is cool. But, um, my surroundings were, were less, you know, we were more like heavy metal kids. Those are the kids that were on my block listening to heavy metal, the older kids. So that's what I listened to type of thing. So, um, I went from heavy metal, but then once I started figuring out what I really liked, it was like funk, bass, kind of percussive. Like I said, I was a drummer, so I've always loved percussive sounds. And so that's what got me into Primus. It was like percussive and melodic and trippy and thumpy and heavy. And just, it was so many things in one. And the guy told amazing stories, Les Claypool. So that's, that was a big influence for me to like start my band. Like, all right. And I didn't want to sound like Primus, but that was like a huge influence in what we were doing. And like I said, that was the mid nineties. And uh, yeah, so we had, we called ourselves Mothership Connection, nice. and uh, yeah, we, it was me and my homies, and we just you know we played for for our, all our all our friends on the blocks in in the school, whatever, like parties, just wherever you know you're a kid, you're doing what you can. So then, did you continue on because this? Uh, I believe it was in what New Mexico or Arizona. We were living at that yeah, time. Yeah, I grew up in Phoenix. I grew up in like Tempe, Mesa, Arizona. Okay, so then you're in Arizona. But then you leave and come to Oregon at some point. And um, that was a bit later. When I was 18, I moved to California. I moved to San Diego. So then between those years, you just mm -hmm. kind of like, I know you went to school. I mean, I had a band the whole, I had the band the whole way through. Really? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we're just in school. Yeah, yeah. I've always had a band like my whole life until I turned into like a DJ guy or whatever. Producer. I'm, you know, now we call it DJing because that's how, 
you know, that's how people perform or whatever. Right. But, um, uh, yeah, I've always been a music. I always wanted to create my own music. It was never the goal to like play other people's music when the whole DJing thing happened. But, um, yeah, so I always had a band with those guys. They were my homies from high school, right? We all skateboarded. We were like skaters, you know, so we skateboarded together. We made music together. And so when I moved to San Diego, they kind of, I lived there for like a year or two and then I moved up to Tahoe because I was really into skating and snowboarding. So Tahoe was, was the jam for that stuff. And all those guys, they kind of showed up a little bit later. We kept our band going for a while. So then you're in Tahoe at that point. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. Yeah. I lived in San Diego. Loved it. Loved the SoCal energy. I mean, Phoenix, Arizona, Mesa, it's a nice place. There's good stuff going on, like good people, but there's, there's not a lot of like culture culture you know i mean now there probably is but when at that point there wasn't so i was like i went hey i'm headed to california you know? so during that time you're expressing yourself musically you're finding that muse and making it happen but were you getting paid at all did you feel like this was something uh, you yeah, could we had do a few professionally? Paid gigs I mean, we, I mean, my goal was always just to be a, like at that young age, you know, I want to be a rock star or whatever, especially in those days, because it was such a big deal, right? Like a rock star was actually a rock star. So yeah, when you're young and you're programmed by the matrix, watching music videos and all these kinds of things, that's what, that's what you want to do if you, if you're into making music. So, um, uh, yeah, I was always doing that. We'd get, we were, you know, we were getting paid gigs. We weren't like banking out, blowing up tours. It's not like we had management or anything like that to really take us to the next level, but we were homies, you know, we, we enjoyed it. We all lived in a house together and made music and recorded and it would be cool if some of those recordings showed up, but I think they were all on old ass PCs from the mid to late nineties. So those hard drives are long gone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a lot of music lost in the ether, but supposedly... If you know about the Akashic Records, hopefully it's still out there. Maybe we can download it from there one day, far, far in the future. But so you're in Tahoe continuing your musical career. At some point you get to Portland. I know that is that that after the Tahoe experience, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I lived in Tahoe for a few years, making music with my homies. And the same thing, I mean, it is the, the quote unquote sticks, right? It's a bunch of trees. There's not a lot going on. So like, oh, I want to take my music to the next level. And it's funny because I was considering moving to LA, but for some reason I ended up in Portland, just checking it out or whatever. I love to travel. You know, I was kind of like a West Coast hippie, like you were saying, I loved festivals and, and that kind of just alternative energy, alternative lifestyle energy. So I, was, I ended up in Portland. I was like, well, this place is chill. And it was actually not so daunting. Like moving to a city like LA or San Francisco was like, whoa, big city, you know? Portland was kind of a nice middle ground. It was easy to, to get established. And then, so yeah, just kept my band going there. And then I uh, set up with some other homies. We started the band Luminous Fog. And that was like, you know, the 2000s era, early 2000s. And Luminous Fog was actually an incredible band. That was the first time I was yeah. personally exposed to your music. It was, nice. from my perspective, a fusion of jam band, hip hop, uh, reggae, all these different flavors coming together. You had the Afro-Cuban vibes, just all these different vibes coming together. And they had a really organic, amazing sound really creative lyrics and really positive messages in the music. And that yep. was kind of the first band that really started to attract attention, at least at a local level, the point where people were booking you consistently, right? Yeah, yeah. We were definitely doing more of our thing, same thing, playing shows, playing festivals, getting out of our little bubble, like actually doing legit festivals in front of a lot of people and stuff. And uh, once again, we were just kind of like young kids throwing it together. This was pre-internet for the most part it was borderline when the internet was starting to like people were actually using it for things so same thing no management no artists or uh, no no booking agents or anything like that we're just doing it ourselves but at least we were we were getting around playing up and down the west coast a little bit and if you're familiar with electronic music you know there's people listening from all over the world we're up to 26 countries now there's people listening nice. all over the world nice there's nice a few artists besides actually three total yeah that came out of Luminous Fog that actually had a really great career. That's first of all, of course, is Nico Luminous. He's here with us. Mm -hmm. And Afro Q Ben is another producer who had a successful career enough to where he attracted some fans and a fan base. And also yeah. Russ Liquid came out of uh, Luminous Fog. He was the keyboard Dude, player for a huge. while. And he did. Yeah, go he was horns and horns and keyboard. Yeah. Yeah. And he was in Luminous Fog and you know, you've seen him around in the, burning man jam band scene he's oh dude russ went went took it pretty far you know i mean he was playing with grammatic he was grammatic's keyboard player and all sorts of the russ was really good he was a jazz musician so i think he really understood 
not only music in an awesome way, he was super creative, did his own thing, but he understood like collaboration and networking with like larger artists. And he was able to leverage all that skills. And he like his, you know, crazy ass, awesome energy and just leverage it into like getting, you know, I think he got on some legit booking agent. Yeah. Um, I remember he was on sound tribe sector nines label for a while before. I don't know if that's still active, but he was on yeah, that. He was even while. playing with those guys on stage and stuff. So. Yeah. He did have a career. So luminous fog was a cool, almost super group. And I did notice on eBay, <laughs> I saw uh, <laughs> one of the very rare copies of your only release, the luminous fog release that's going for a hundred bucks. Hey, you know, that's Shut uh, up. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's selling, you know, really the value is de dependent on the person selling it, but Hey, yeah, somebody's so taking funny. a chance, you know, that's I, epic. Hey, I still have I a sealed it. copy somewhere. Um, so then, right. okay. So let's, we really want to talk about electronic music today because a lot of people don't understand that there is kind of a spiritual metaphysical aspect to electronic music that makes it really appealing to a lot of people. So, um, you changed at that point, Luma's fog kind of ended, you know, people parted ways, went on their own and you kind of shifted from doing live music into the electronic music, composing in a DAW going into that format. What, what was the big shift and what was the catalyst for that? Um, yeah, there was a few things. I think playing festivals and playing shows and being like right there at the burgeoning brink of like electronic music not being like this hardcore techno rave type situation but like the west coast producers like bass nectar was an early one like i remember playing shows with bass nectar and you know sure we played and he played later on and there was only like you know 40 50 people out there but the music he was playing and the glitch mob too they were in that mix too and so this is when everything was just getting started of course they were a much bigger deal than us but i'm just saying we were like playing earlier on the stages and it was still small gigs and uh, just like whoa I like this music because what I found uh, was the music was like hip hop and reggae, but it was like electronic sounds. It wasn't like super fast techno. It was like slowed down tempo with drums, bass lines, and had like hip hop samples. And I was like, oh, this is this is rad. And so I probably wouldn't have been around that music if it wasn't for being in a band and playing those festivals. And then Russ and I, I mean, the catalyst, I remember the moment like clear as day is Russ and I went to Shambhala Music Festival up in Canada just to go check it out. Cause you're like, Oh, we heard this thing's pretty cool. Let's go see these guys. And, um, and we, first time we heard Tipper, first time I saw a bass nectar play for like a, a rather large size audience. I saw Ott, I saw, um, Spongel, saw so many artists and we were like, blew our minds. Like this music, like what we had never heard anything like that. It was like brand new, brand new, brand new, like, holy shit. And so him and I, I remember him looking at, we're looking at each other, like, dude, we have to learn how to make this music as soon as we get home. So that was 2005. I remember it like yesterday, that was August, yeah. 2005. And we just got back home and both of us just kind of got our little computers going with our little software. And uh, yeah, we got to work and started figuring it out. And it took, took a couple of years to, to really kind of figure it out how to make those kind of beats sound good. We could make the beats, but didn't mean they sounded good. I think as technology evolves and, ha and it has evolved since 2005, the composition skills, the ability to create this music has gotten easier and more functional. You know, the computers aren't glitching out. You're able to process yeah, more sounds at once. There's so much more you can do. So it's so much more functional because like you said, you were there at the beginning, right? When it was starting and all the technology, you look at the computers of 2004 and 2005, they're almost unusable. Like maybe you can send an email or something, yeah. right? And that's, yeah, we started on Ableton 4, Ableton 5. Right, and that's the computer's that people were composing all this music on. So it was, it was a struggle in itself just because of where the technology was at that time. Yeah. Faux show. So Let's go closer. what do you think is special? What makes electronic music special that as you started kind of playing these shows and composing this music, you started to feel this connection and it made you notice that there was something unique about this because you can do melodic music. You can compose, but there, there is something a little bit sweeter, something a little bit different that that is unique to electronic music. Do you think you could describe that? You know, for me, what attracted it, one big component was the crowd, the audience. Like, you know, they were just out there, freaky, dressed in like crazy dope costumes, and they just really got into it. And, you know, of course, psychedelics plays a big part of that. Like, you just experience the music in, in a much different way. And I love live music. I love live band, like, to this day. You know, I love that kind of sound. But when it's 
when the song is mixed and mastered and you're really tightening it up the sound and you're playing it through a CDJ turntable laptop, whatever, it goes through this huge sound system and the subs and the bass and just hits you like, like a wall of sound. Like you can't, it's harder to get that kind of sound with a live band. And so I think that's one, like the, the sonic quality itself just can floor you. Right. And that's but now as a genre bass music, like just the bass you hit, the bass hits you and you're like, Holy shit. So that's definitely one part. Um, like I said, the people, and as coming from a band and stuff, you know, it's like, it's fun to write music with other people. I think, you know, now looking back on it, I would like to get back into that. But in those days, sometimes, you know, you might have one musical idea and the guitar player or the whatever keyboard player has a different idea and the song doesn't come out the way you wanted it to come out. Right. So when you're in a band, but when you're by yourself and you're like, wait, I can make, make this sound like me, like this is my sound that I created. So that that's one part of it too. You know? Yeah, you kind of not only have control over all aspects of the composition, you actually have control of how the sounds themselves sound. The yeah, the sound design exactly. Yeah, the sound design, so it creates something that's almost impossible to replicate by humans. Like you could create it as a human experience through the laptop and through the digital audio workstation. For those that don't know what a DAW is these programs that they use to compose this music, you can express yourself that way, but the music it creates cannot be re reproduced by humans in that way. I mean, now, now that like, it's like you almost, I, I would like have a project where you kind of reverse engineer it and you have a band and people are dropping those electronic sounds and stuff like that. But yeah, it's like when you're creating, it's just freedom. And also I'm a, most artists are super introverted you know, type of people. I'm extremely introverted and I'm, I'm happy spending lots of time alone. Like not because I don't love people because I love human beings, but um, I'm just, you know, love hanging out alone. So, and I love making music. So that's the perfect formula for someone wanting to be an electronic music producer or a music producer. You can make any kind of music, but just someone that produces music on their own with a computer or whatever. It doesn't have to be a computer. You could be using keyboards and hardware and drum machines. Well, there is something about how, frequencies affect musical frequencies, the actual energy of the sounds and how they affect us metaphysically, spiritually, they hit our chakras and stimulate them, our energy centers in a certain way. I've heard people describe bass frequencies as kind of stimulating those lower root chakras. And then you think of the very high frequency like guitars or keyboards stimulating like your crown chakra. What are your thoughts right. on that? Oh dude, hundred percent for sure. And once again, I love to witness that stuff. Um, that that's fun. You know, you go to like a jam band like String Cheese, The Rapal Dead, it's a lot of dee 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 noodly, and people are like doing this dance and stuff. And then you go to like a trap show, bass, and people are like, oh, and they're they're dropping it. You know, like you can see it, like the visual representation of what you just said. I love that. That's fun. Wow. I just love witnessing how music affects people. You know, it is kind of interesting, and I think that that's one of the things that makes electronic music so special is because you can create like you said, a wall of sound or really just like a spectrum of frequencies that can hit all those energy centers perfectly and then all at once. And yeah. which is really hard to do even with a band of really talented musicians. So you're yeah. able to- Well, a big part- Oh, go on. No, sorry, go ahead. Go I'm ahead. sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. So a big part of that, uh, the electronic music experience is understanding that you can experience sound in that way. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, just to like kind of cap on what you're saying, it's a big part of it's the mixing and the mastering. Right. Like when you're able to create a bass line or your drum part, and you mix it and compress it and hit it with the limiters and the overdrives and distortions, it just hits so much harder. It's harder to do that with a live band unless you have a dope ass engineer that really knows what's going on. But that's like not just, you know, it's like a whole, yeah, you just don't, it's harder to like make a live drum set sound like a mix and master drum set. Or, or drum beat rather, you know, in a produced track. And that's why it's so disappointing when you're at a concert and the sound guy kind of sucks or you just, it just, the, the room could be the issue as well. And you know, the sound guy could be like, well, my God, it's the room. The room sucks. Well, yeah. those shows are hard. If, if the because, room sucks, the room sucks. Doesn't matter if it's good electronic music. Right. Or so, whatever. Uh, you know, that's why it's so crucial to have really good sound. And that's why we really appreciate fidelity. Yeah, I think fan tipper, of fidelity. tipper won't play. Like you have to pay his guy to tune the room, like a good amount of money. 
and he won't even play unless the room is tuned. And you know, Tipper's the master of masters. You know, everybody knows wow. that if you're in electronic music at all. And uh, yeah, he takes it seriously. And I, I mean, I would love to be able to take it to that level. Like, hey, the room has to sound right. I want the the sound as an experience. You know, and uh, has to hit properly. Sure. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more about the differences of performing with a live band, a live audience, and just being up there by yourself? in a DJ situation? I mean, there's so much more magic when you're playing with, with people on stage. I feel like there's no comparison when you're like work with your homie and you're creating these parts and you both love the song or both, or however many people in the band, like luminous fog had like six to nine people in it sometimes. Right. And the shit's just locking in. That is a magic that, that can't be duplicated by some guy pressing a button and waving his arms around. Like I could be me. I'm not dissing on it, but uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just, it's just different. Um, so yeah, there's more magic, but once again, the sound doesn't hit as hard. And, um, but I mean, you know, they're, they're half and half. Like I said, I've seen some live bands really hit. I've never seen like Odessa play, but I know they're like a huge electronic band that has, you know, a lot of followers. That, like say Little Dragon, they have a really good band where and no, it's like they play their songs, their hits, but then they also break into these sick like electronic music jams and you can watch on stage. It's guys making the music live with instruments and playing and it sounds really cool. And uh, there, there is more magic that comes because I feel like humans were all these like magnetic spiritual frequency right and then when you harmonize with another human you're like locking in on the beats or on whatever that magic can't be can't be duplicated and that's why you have jam bands like grateful dead and you know all the people that have followed them there's magic there and especially when you add improvisation when you're just kind of flowing and letting magic unfold like that's just you know so cool yeah there is an improvisational element to the electronic experience but yes it's true the magic of a live band synced up you know and with people taking, they're really good and they've been playing together a long time. You, man. Wow. Yeah. You yeah. really, but it's a different type of energy. I've often compared it to experiencing a different type of divine energy. So like you go to these electronic shows, maybe you're experiencing the sacred geometry, like perfect symmetrical, like crazy mathematical divine experience. And then I when agree. you're at the jam band shows, you're experiencing this very loose kind of cosmic deep space morphing uh, nebula clouds type of divine experience. And then of course you think of reggae, which is like straight up going to church, right? Yeah. And exactly, so it's like down exactly. on the earth, like experience. So there's just all yeah. these different ways of approaching this same energy. Yeah, 100%, 100%. But yeah, that would be my answer. Like the feeling as a performer, uh -huh. it's way more fun to be. Or for me, I'm an instrumentalist. Like I grew up playing instruments, banging on drums, playing guitar, playing keyboard. Like that's so, and I love playing like congas and percussion. That might be my favorite instrument and piano. But um, it's just when you're using your body to create the music and someone else is doing that and you guys are locked in, like that's an untouchable feeling, honestly as far as being on stage and crushing it in that zone. Yeah, for sure. Well, let's uh, segue into something we discussed on the last episode with Josh C. Hernandez of okay. Section C Records and Zion Management. We talked <clears throat> about artists that tapped into the shamanic understanding of performing on a stage. So when you have people together, especially people that are on psychedelic drugs and you start stacking them up. There's like a thousand, 5,000, 10,000, and they're all yeah, yeah, yeah. focused on this one point. And especially in electronic mm -hmm. music, when it's actually in most cases, one person, mm -hmm. they become this shamanic guide. And that music that they're playing is taking them on this journey. Their set yeah. is that journey. And, you know, obviously jam bands play for three hours, sometimes even longer. And that's part of the experience. But in the electronic music world, it's really only like the West Coast, the Burning Man vibes, that kind of really symbiosis that really tap into the shamanic aspect of electronic music. But can you speak about your experiences fulfilling that shamanic role with thousands of people on psychedelic drugs? <laughs> um, I've definitely been in that position, played for huge crowds and I, exactly what you said, everyone's focused. And I mean, yeah, on the flip side of what I said, I love playing like something about playing with people, playing instruments, but yeah, when you spend all this time creating the track, especially when, you, when, I mean, I know myself and a lot of producers in my community, they put a lot of intention into their music. They're not just like, oh, I'm going to make a banger to, to, for people to bang to you. Like that's one aspect of it. But yeah, I want 
I'm thinking of it on a cellular level of frequencies and all this stuff that you're talking about. And so that's important to me, even if it's like some crazy trap music or whatever. So um, that that's an amazing feeling just to like really put so much time into a track. And then, like I said, you press that button and everyone loses their shit. That's a fucking awesome feeling too. I mean, you can't, you know, that's a special feeling in itself, like on the shamanic aspect that you're talking about, you know, it's, um, I mean, I guess that is sort of a thing. Like they're, everyone's on their own journey. They're listening to this music and you are the one guiding them along. And uh, yeah, that's a cool feeling. It's a lot of, I mean, I'm honored and blessed to like get that responsibility. The last show I played right before this whole COVID shutdown was a, a nice headlining set at Envision Festival. Shout out to Envision. Man, I love those guys so much and girls, all the, all the good people who put on Envision and work to make oh, it happen. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and uh, man, that was great. <clears throat> and I played, um, you know, kind of an earthy, slower tempo set. I played some some more mid-tempo bangers in there for sure, but that was my intention. I just felt like I just wanted to ground out and some, some heavy, slow bass. Uh, that was that was my intention for that one. So, And it felt good, felt good for sure. Do you think producers that are producing now need to embrace this perspective more and realize that these people are on substances that are opening them up in a spiritual way and kind of try to create music that, fulfills that shamanic guidance role? I mean, people are just going to create what they create. Yeah. I think intention is good. I've definitely been in the crowd and like been in that moment where some, you know, big famous producer is like up there and he's just dropping super negative energy. Like the music has a lot of super negative energy. And really? like, dude, you're booked at, at like a hippie festival or whatever, like symbiosis, you know, I'm not going to say what year or what artist, but I was like, just couldn't believe all the gnarly like negative lyrical imagery that was coming out was like the peak of the, you know those festivals like you said like certain ones like symbiosis or lightning in a bottle like those people i feel like that crowd wants positive energy it doesn't have to be like super corny cheesy like extra happy but you know what i mean it has to have some good energy in it and uh so i've been there when i when i felt like that artist was blowing it or maybe they flew in that artist from the other side of the world or far away and they have no idea about that community like what you know and I've just been like, wow, oops. Yeah, I have also that, been that's to a shows like and, and had to leave. Yeah, and I've heard other thing. people. Yeah, I've heard other people like, oh my god, that artist, what well, was supposed to be like this big famous artist, and kind of blew it. And I was like, yeah, I was feeling you on that. Like, definitely had those conversations and experiences. And I'm not trying to knock anybody. It's just, you know, part. It's it happens sometimes. No, it's something that the you have to be aware of if you're a performer. And you're coming into these energy fields where people are wanting to resonate with love. They're not taking these substances to go down a dark hole into hell. Like they're taking these substances <laughs> to open up and express love and feel divinity, whatever that is. We always say it's the great yeah. mystery. Like they're, yeah. so they don't want to hear intensely uh, gratifying sexual gratification, demeaning lyrics, violence. Just they, yeah, the misogynistic, like, oh, it's just God. like, dude, this ain't the place for that. You yeah, know? no, no. And that's, well, and, and then in a way, is Earth a place for that? Because when we're in our psychedelic state, it's almost like that's our most true estate. So it's almost like makes you wonder you. if <laughs> there's well, even Yeah, a we place can go. I mean, yeah, we, I mean, <laughs> the more you study the music industry, you understand it's like, like, I was just watching a Chappelle thing and he's like, it's, it's a monster, you know, and it has its different, it's different ways of expressing itself. And like, yeah, there's, there's people out there that want to control the way the world thinks. And then the way they can do that is by making these artists that promote crazy amounts of negativity and crazy amounts of misogyny and just all kinds of negative stuff and make those guys super famous. And then they have everybody repeating those lyrics. And so, yeah, I mean, it is. It does lower the frequency. Layers. And it yeah, doesn't take away from the that, art of it because you hear these tracks and a lot of these tracks that kind of fall into what you're talking about. And even in mainstream pop, it's it's all all genres. The, you know, there's art behind the production. and, and these Oh, people the make, artists are amazing. They're but super then talented. It gets used in such a way to where it is programming and it's designed to get you to resonate with lower frequencies and materialism in order to keep you from being successful is really the true oh, yeah. meaning. Of yeah. It. I mean, they're, they're putting the, they're putting the world under a spell for sure. And I don't know if you've heard that bit about how Hollywood, like what the Hollywood with the Holly trees, actually that was a, they would use that stick for casting like yes. ma for magic wands for casting. The Holly spells. wood of the Holly tree, the Holly separate the word Hollywood. 
And that is what they use for these strange magic wands throughout history. And, and in some cases, very dark rituals. It's just exactly. this symbol of magic. There's so much yeah. more going on than, than <laughs> what this, yeah, yeah. what most people are aware of. It's a very limited bandwidth of what people are actually perceiving. And then the, what's really happening is like, whoa, it's like, you know, a whole other, whole other experience. But, you know, even in this time of COVID, you know, you haven't mm-hmm. really been out there. Obviously you've probably done a couple virtual shows, but no real shows because everybody's been kind of shut down. So mm-hmm. it's been a really interesting time, but you have been a force. And like I said, down in the trenches with us, living with us, being a huge part of the, West coast and even Colorado East coast international festival scene for over 25 years. So from your perspective, what has changed in the festival worlds? What are some of the indicators of evolution? What's really different from then to now? Um, I mean, there's just, there's just more festivals, right? There's just more, it's kind of like anything in life. Like there's more stuff. Right now, there's more artists, there's more rappers, there's more DJs, there's more of everything. So there's more festivals too. So I feel like you do have some smaller startup festivals like keeping it super rad and like their intentions, like, oh, I want to make this great party and good vibes and blah, 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 blah. And then there's other festivals that kind of get to the next level, just like an artist, right? You start getting more famous or more cloud or whatever. And then maybe you get bought out by some big company, Live Nation or Golden Voice or something. And then you kind of got to play by those rules. So it doesn't matter if you're a festival or an artist. So that's just part of the game, right? You see some festivals get usurped by these bigger production companies. And it's not like even, I'm not saying it's bad or good. It's just what happens, right? Like it's hard, whether you're an artist or a festival to pay your bills. Like, Well, you think about all the uh, independent festivals that we used to go to personally. I didn't even know you back then, but I know that we went to those same festivals and they were all independently managed, independently promoted. And the most successful ones were bought out and right. the ones that couldn't compete are now gone. Well, a lot of it's like we, you're at the festival, right? You're looking at all this, like, oh my God, this is amazing. There's all this huge epic stick, but you don't realize maybe the, the person putting on the festival or persons putting on the festival is like losing their ass, losing tens of thousands of dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, putting on this festival in hopes of either breaking even, making a small profit. It's the same with the artists. You might look at this artist, they're up there DJing, crushing it for thousands of people, and then they're still having trouble paying their bills or whatever. So it's just difficult to make the ends meet. I'm not saying all, it's kind of like a winner take all. And then you have those few, few artists or festivals that are just cleaning house and they're, they're doing well. But, um, I don't know what, uh, how I got on that. I'm just saying how things change, how, how things change. It's just like, you just, you things see grow and evolve. And so then when those things kind of go bigger, then you see some new upstarts, right? It's kind of like some DJ, you see some DJ get big, blah, blah, blah. And then there's some like new guy, younger guy that's like dope and making that rad music. And everyone's like changed their focus to that. And then the bigger guy has his broader audience. And that's just kind of how life goes, you know, festivals and music are just a part of life. And so you see that happen with all kinds of things. And it seems like it has infiltrated mainstream culture because when we oh, yeah. first started going to festivals all those years ago, I started going to festivals right around the same time as Nico did. It, they were very fringe. Like it was not very public. You had these festivals. They were like, wow, you're going to that thing way out there. Like what? Well, you're going to camp for three days. <laughs> yeah. And it was very like, what are, I didn't realize you were following the grateful dead. You know, it's like, it's really how people perceived it. And now it's very mainstream. These festivals like oh, Coachella definitely. and all Bonnaroo has now got bought out and by live nation. And you have these huge festivals. All I mean, you think of electric Daisy carnival and all those huge festivals and it's so mainstream. It's so part of popular culture. But let me tell you people, it was not always like this. And we got to see that growth and we got to see that development over time. Pretty awesome. Skateboarding is the same thing. It's like back in the nineties, like people shat on us like, Oh, you're skater, freaking nerd. We dressed in, you know, dressed in baggier clothes, all these kinds of things. And now look at like skateboarders are just as popular as NBA players and stuff like that. And it's, uh, that's just what happens with life. So I feel like I'm so blessed or you, us to like been around in those days to watch shit get going on and pop in. And now things are where they're at. And so that's why I'm just like learning to just take it slow and witness everything and really be in the moment with everything and be stoked on it because yeah, things change over time and so and once you also you can recognize those patterns how to kind of get in your zone where you can make it work for you you know 
Well, going to all those festivals, I feel like I learned a lot about personal development, about spirituality, how to be a better person, not just from my psychedelic experiences, but just from interacting with the people that were at the festivals at that Mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Did you have some of those similar experiences? Can you describe some of those times where you've learned something from a festival or something that made you a better person? Yeah, I mean, let me, I mean, if I, I don't know if I could just pull up a specific example right off the bat, <laughs> but I mean, I mean, no, so I'm not, but um, yeah, in general, exactly. There's so much positive energy. Like for me, it always comes back to just positive energy, that cycle, right? And so, yeah, so, you know, people are working through stuff. Say you're on some mushrooms and some amazing DJ or a band is just really dropping some music and it's, you're open, you're growing, you're processing, you're thinking, you're just, it's like all, you're like blooming kind of inward and outward. And that's, you can't get that by sitting in, in your house and listening to music. I mean, maybe you can, but it's just not the same because there might be some person next to you that's having that same experience and that all just kind of, you know, it's a ripple effect. Um, so yeah, like the festivals that we go to, I mean, you know, you got like, you could be going to the Juggalo festival, right? Like it's probably different over there. <laughs> and uh, they're, they're having their fun though too. So it's all good. But, yeah, I um, haven't been. But, I... but they're also bonding as a family, you know I mean? They're like, Oh, Juggalo family. So there's something about being when you're all there, cause you're there for the music. Most people, 90% of the people, 80% are there for the music. The rest are there for the party or for some drugs or whatever. Maybe they want to meet somebody, but uh, most of the people are there for the music and that unites people. Music unites people. We all know that it doesn't matter what, year it is music brings people together and so and when people come together you know yeah positive things can definitely happen yeah that's kind of the purpose of these festivals a lot of these festivals that we went to and still go to and and once life restarts Mm -hmm. after this covid thing is kind of mitigated then we'll be back and they have personal development speakers a lot of workshops they were always there a lot of the good festivals that we went to like burning man they they had these resources available for when people were taking these psychedelic drugs and they would open up in a safe environment because people were camping. Mm-hmm. Right. They had an interface to bounce off of and, and try to make sense of some of these experiences. That was kind of part of the festival culture too. I'm sure you went to some of those workshops and things back in the day. Yeah. Always drop in, peep this tent, peep that tent, see what's going on. And um, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, like I said, it's hard for me just to pull up a specific example right off the bat. No, it's okay. For me, the opening and growing always happened when really good music was happening. And and that's always an inward experience. But then, like I said, you look over, the other person's got a big ass smile on their face too. They're opening, they're growing. And then afterward, you know, you're talking about, oh, so-and-so set was so sick. Like, and you know, that's, it's just positive energy for sure. <clears throat> so you're deeply rooted in the music business. What are some of the feelings about when things might open back up from an industry standpoint, have you heard anything about what some of the trends might be as far as when they feel like things could be safe again? Or is it really just kind of all up in the air because of COVID? I mean, man, I, I couldn't give you any like legitimate, information on that kind of stuff because i'm just a civilian down here <laughs> but yeah i I've, I've i've been seeing some posts oh live music might come back in fall of 2021 and someone just said on the uh burning man website just someone yesterday mentioned oh it said the man burns in 200 whatever days I'm like oh shit so <clears throat> who knows what that means but you know people got their hopes up and, and that's cool i mean i'm I feel blessed because I needed a break from constantly traveling and hopping on a plane or hopping and going here going there like so I needed a break and I barely even made that much music. I did put out an EP that, but that was like older music that I've been wanting to put out for like over a year. You know, I was thinking I just sit down and finish it. And now I've been working on new album, new songs. And uh, so I'm just happy to like not be traveling, not be going everywhere and just kind of be grounded. I'm a Taurus and they say Tauruses are homebodies and earthy. And so for me, it's just all about grounding, you know, and, yeah, so you've, you've got energy. to take a break. You've got to hang out and create more music. There's so many musicians right now that have this huge output because they're home for the first time in potentially decades, depending on where they're right. at in their career. And yeah, yeah. they're just making music. So it sounds like that's what you're doing as well. And it is interesting to try to find the good in this situation. So you're saying for you as a musician, the good is being able to be at home and nestle in because it's your natural state and really dig into making music again yeah i mean ultimately 
if I wanted to talk about, say, my legacy or whatever, I would want that to be like, I just made a bunch of great music. Two, three hundred years later, you can like check out my music. Like, oh, this was rad. This guy lived this time. Like you look at Rembrandt or Van Gogh, right? Those guys are long gone, but we're still admiring their paintings. That's amazing to me. Like that concept, or even Bob Marley, you know, he's gone not that long ago. If, in looking at it in that type of um, lens, like, you know, 30, 40 years ago, he, where people are still bumping his music so many so i feel like that's important to me but then in the here and now i'm stoked that i got to play a bunch of shows and i know i've stoked people out when i play my sets you know you know i have my crowd i have my my folks that really support me and love my music and man how lucky am i that i got to do all that like it's so, so awesome so it'll come back when it comes back and we don't man we don't know what's going to happen on earth you know day to day yeah it's actually true you never know tomorrow we could be dust tomorrow we could be heaven who the hell knows it's all up in the air but do you think you're going to be doing more Virtual shows, are you going to try to make more of an online presence doing these live stream concerts at all? Or what's your take on I played, that? I played one live stream and it was super fun. But for me, it felt like I was just DJing. I mean, I even play, if I'm playing my own music, I'm DJing my music, right? I want to be performing playing instruments and you know dropping beats in that format like a lot like i i call it dropping beats because i create these beats and i drop them like djing you're saying mixing a bunch of other people's music together and i'll play other people's music like i kind of mix it up but i want to have a live show where i'm dropping my beats my bass i love bass heavy bass and i'm playing instruments along with it i would love to maybe have a collaborator that i play along with or you know so i'm just more stoked on creating that music right now and really putting it in a format and then I'll be playing some live shows, live stream shows or whatever. Um, but I might, I might do some live DJ sets, but for me, it's just like, you know, you only have so much energy. So I'm trying to put my energy into creating something that I'm just really excited about. Yeah. It seems like people need it though. They're missing you out there. They're remembering you all those <laughs> years. They saw you and they just want to see you one more time. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I mean, I'm looking forward to it and yeah, I know some cats, you know, it's not like all about the money or whatever, but I know some cats that are, doing their live streams and they stick to a schedule and they're, they're pulling in some money on that. And nice. that's awesome. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're generating revenue and taking care of their lives as they should. Yeah. And doing what you love, you know, nice. um, I, I get excited by so many things. So I'm like working on different business ventures, different music stuff. Like I'm helping other artists produce their albums and uh, you know, it's good to focus on one thing, but then sometimes it's good to like do other stuff. Cause then that kind of adds back to that one thing that you're trying to do. Well, yeah, sure. Well, let's just elaborate on that. Speaking about doing what you love, tell me about some of the upcoming music projects you have and other things that are coming soon from Nico Luminous. Um, I am dropping a single. I was trying to actually get it uploaded this week because I wanted to drop it by the inauguration. That was my goal. Not a political song, but it kind of ties into just, you know, all the uh, absurdity unity? of life is right it, now. Is it a theme of unity? Hopefully it's a theme of unity. I want yeah, people yeah, to come together. Yeah, of course. Every, everything. Yeah, yeah. It, like I said, it's not like a, you know, yeah, it's just kind of just playing on the absurdity of life right now. All this funny stuff we see on the news and all the different programming we're being subjected to psychological programming. Yeah. What's up um, with that? Let's talk about that for a second. So what is some of the programming we're being exposed to? Like, how are we being programmed right now from your perspective? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, man, it's like, I feel like it's so self evident. It's so obvious. Um, but there's so much going on and we just, don't know what we're being told right we just know what they're telling us and then so it's like about i mean for me it's about using critical thinking and common sense like i'm not a scientist so i just don't even want to speak on anything and sound like an idiot like a lot of people think they're scientists and uh and they're not and they're just making all these crazy posts like they think they know everything and so i don't want to be one of those people so what i'm getting at is this psychological programming you see it through the tv you see it through you know online now and it's just um it's just a lot it's just a lot of programming coming out us every which way <clears throat> and as we were talking about before the, the mainstream i just call it the matrix right the mainstream matrix doesn't matter if it's fox or cnn they all want us to think what they want us to think it's like why don't we just stop and just think about like how am i going to improve myself like for me it's more about deprogramming like because all that stuff at a young age, we're just being bombarded with it. Even now it's, it's even more because it's coming from all angles and everyone's holding a phone all the time. But um, 
before it just used to come for your TV. And then you shut your kid, right? You shut your TV off and you go ride your bike. Like it's just like, it's not like that anymore. <laughs> so for me, right. So for me, it's about deprogramming meditation. Um, my favorite thing in life right now is just going out and skateboarding, getting out in the sun, skating, pushing myself physically and mentally. I'm 42 years old and I'm skating like so much. Not, I'm actually not skating like a, as much as I used to when I was a kid, but I'm skating better because I'm focusing my mind. It's awesome. It feels amazing. And so I guess that's what I'm getting at. It's like when you can focus your mind on like an outcome and then achieve that outcome, that's so much better than like feeling like, oh, I'm so educated because I watched this, you know, content that someone made me want to think like. So it's I'm just, very true. And it seems like the, the media is, no matter what side of the fence you're on, spiritually, politically, it seems like the media is dividing us and really inciting this anger against us as, as brothers and sisters of the human race. Yeah. And we just right. really need to mm -hmm. focus on what unifies us and, and what makes us come together versus all of our divisions. I've personally made efforts to really help people understand that even though they're angry, they shouldn't be expressing these hateful things online and, and various nice. things that they're doing. Cause I've seen so much of it from, from many people. And right. I just try my best to really just say, Hey, you know, just remember that we're all human brothers and sisters and we just all have to figure out a way to come together because I know things yeah, could be frustrating, sure. but it's just like, we have to, well, there's plenty of reasons to be angry. And like yeah. you and I, I mean, honestly, like, you know, For you sure. and I are white, you and I are white. We don't have to worry about getting pulled over and getting shot down in our car just because like we maybe rolled through a stop sign, maybe didn't even roll through the stop sign. Like if that, I mean, I couldn't imagine that being like a legitimate worry. Like every time you see a cop, you're like, oh my God, are those guys going to kill me? You know what I mean? So that's a legit worry for the black community. And so that's something to be angry about. Now, um, like I said, how we express the anger, that's, that's not up for me to judge how someone's going to do that. But as far as the political stuff, it's like, yeah, this president, that president, they're all part of the different arm and leg of the same monster. Right. For and, sure. um, yeah. And so I'm not going to let that steal my inner peace, you know? Yes. Um, Incredible advice. You, know, you don't want it to I steal mean, your inner peace because that's kind of what it's designed to do. They want you to be destabilized. Exactly. Exactly. So it's like, you know, everyone's just got their own thing that we're working. We've all had different experiences. Some people have some serious traumas that, you know, really affect the way they operate. And uh, it's just about being compassionate, compassionate, empathetic, and all those good things. But um, man, I mean, that's the thing. If you actually back to critical thinking, if you really sit there and think and observe what's going on, hell yeah, dude, I get super pissed off. It's very worthy of being angry. It's like, whoa, we're being psychologically programmed to hate each other like you were kind of just getting at for whatever reason. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just all so much. So yeah, I'm just trying to maintain my inner peace. Cause I know by being a peaceful individual and having a good calm mindset that that's going to ripple out into the world. And someone might pick up on my energy and be like, oh, okay, maybe I want to be a little more of a peaceful person to inner peace. Cause you know, it's, it's not like everyone's trying to fight each other. You see that on the news you see that coming through your phone, but you walk outside, you're like, I don't see people trying to fight each other and you know, <laughs> these kinds of things. But um, yeah, like I said, I mean, just on, on the heavy vibes, it's like, yeah, it's very clear. It's very apparent. We live in a white power country. The whole country is founded on white power. It's like it's clear as day, right? There's no, you, you can't dispute that. But yeah, so I, what am I supposed to do about that? I don't know. Like, I'm just, I just have to remain peaceful on the inside and to pray. And if, you know, I don't know if I'm called to do something more, like I'll, I'll listen to the calling. I'll heed the calling, but right now I'm just trying to like stay calm, stay neutral and uh, yeah, just put out good energy for people to tap into. For sure. I constantly try to remind people that, you know, always remember we're light beings in a physical body and truly our truest self is that light being that light body that's the human. Yeah, We're in 100%. these vehicles. These vehicles are different. They've always been yeah, different, yeah. but we've designed these concepts of race and, and how we categorize people through history. It's always been different. It's never actually been the same. At some point in our history of humanity, 
we were just humans loving each other on earth and we were just so in yeah. love with each other. And that's really what we got to get back to. We respect each right. other. We respect each other's cultures, all our differences. doesn't matter who you are. You just got to remember that inside of everyone is that wonderful spark, that, that light, that divinity, that godness, that that's what unites us and makes us one. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we all want to, yeah. I mean, there's so many aspects like of just like what's going on. Yeah, it's a lot of scarcity. People are afraid. So they want to like fight and, and hurt other people because they feel like what they have is being taken. And some people's stuff is actually being taken. You look at like the indigenous people in the Amazon, like their stuff's being taken and they are doing what you just said, but they're still getting fucked over. You know what I mean? Yes, That's we, not okay. We do That's need a consciousness shift. About. There does yeah, have yeah. to be, and there, and people, anger doesn't have to be a negative energy. You know, anger yeah. can stimulate change in a way that exactly. makes us a better there you world. Go. It, there's yeah, nothing there you go. wrong with anger. So you're hearing Nico say, yes, you got to get angry. Of course we have to get angry. I'm not saying you have to get angry. I'm just saying it naturally happens when you yes. think, oh, there's this beautiful tribe of people that's living in the Amazon that haven't changed anything for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, and they're just getting fucked over. You know, like that's, it angers me, but I'm not like, what am I supposed to I don't know if there's right. something I can do. Yeah. You can donate to stuff. That's great. But like, ugh, like what can I actually do? But I, I like what you said though, zone. is like you maintain a certain frequency, you maintain a certain vibration and that creates a ripple effect. And then hopefully that aids in changing the frequency, the entire spectrum of yeah. energy, all that water, all those people, <laughs> that ripple, yeah, whatever sure. that's connecting with, hopefully that's what yeah. we can do. I guess to answer your question, I guess that's what we can do. Or one thing that that's what I'm yeah that's what I'm that's like well that's all I can really do like getting angry online and attacking people and those kinds of things like that's not fixing anything so I might as well not participate in that you know and I've had moments where I tap in a little bit or I might post like some some pictures with heavy energy it's more just to illustrate like you know what's going on but um I don't want to constantly be that frequency and we're humans we have emotions we go up down left right sideways and and that's that's part of being human but like you said it, it needs to be a if you're just like a privileged American person, it needs to be um, channeled, you know, uh, productively. Right. Okay. So you've been a professional now. You, you've had this incredible career. What's some of the advice you can give some up and coming musicians, people that want to have a career similar to yours, they're incredible electronic producers like yourself, and they want to have a similar experience, that type of career. What advice would you give them? Man, I mean, I like to not think backward, but I definitely, there's plenty of times where I think, oh man, I could have done this different. I could have done that different. I could have. And so um, you really got to know what you love and ultimately know what you want to leave behind as an artist. Because when you do that, you're going to do your best work. And sometimes whatever that is, isn't what's going to be big. It isn't what's going to be popular. It isn't going to be what's going to make you money, you know what I mean? But you're going to be happiest with yourself if you do like your ultimate calling, right? And so um, I feel like I started making electronic, coming back to the full band thing, you know, I wanted to sing, rock lyrics. I love writing lyrics. I love to rap. I love just beatboxing. I love that organic energy. And so I did get a bit disconnected from all that being a DJ and, and DJing and all that kind of stuff. And I'm saying that's bad. But so if I look back like, oh man, I wish I would have been doing more of that along with it, like in parallel or something. And so what I'm saying is for that on the advice tip is just like, make sure you're doing exactly what you love and, and, and don't let, don't get distracted by like what you think is going to help you, you know, get on or whatever. And sometimes, you know, it's just hard, man. It's a crap shoot, but I did have a lot of good success. And um, when I was doing my bass music, like, just only bass music I mean, just focused on that one thing so that being said if you can focus on just doing one thing the more you can focus on less things you're going to be more successful as soon as you start doing more and more and more things you're going to be less successful at those things whatever they may be so yeah just like figure out what you really are stoked on doing what you really want to leave behind and focus on that and get to work like don't get distracted don't let people throw you off off your vibe kind of what we were back to what we were saying a second ago and uh you know just just stay locked in the more you can lock in and focus the more success and success could be just whatever outcome you're looking for you know it doesn't have to be i got booked i got money it's streams whatever whatever success looks like to you you have to first determine that and then just lock in you know yeah so you really have to just 
focus on what you're saying, like focus exactly on what you love and do that. Don't try to create things to appease other people. You know, people mm -hmm. trying to tell you, oh, you're going to be successful if you do it this way. If that's not right. the way that's your true destiny, the way that you want to do it, the way that you love doing it, then mm -hmm. don't worry about all that. Just mm -hmm. focus on what you love. Do it exactly the way you want to do it. And you will succeed. The success will be attracted to you because you're living your most true experience. You're being absolutely truthful about what you're yeah. doing. And then the byproduct will be the success for you're looking for. Yeah. You're going to feel the best about your work. When you feel good about your work, like that is such a good feeling when you don't like your work, like it's such a crappy feeling. I would honestly like, as far as like, Oh, I want to, you know, these kind of DJs make more money or whatever. If you go make that kind of music and you're not super into it, you're going to be unhappy and you're going to be like disappointed in how you, how you spent your energy. I would honestly rather me personally, I'm not telling other people to, I'd rather work a job and then come home and make the exact music I want to make than spend my lifetime making a bunch of music that I don't even like and get rich. And I know that sounds weird, but when it pulls from like your soul, soul sucker, you know, there's a word for it. Um, you're not going to be happy. You're going to be bummed on yourself. I'm not saying that's what I did, but sometimes that's kind of where I led and, you know, I'd get back on track. And so, um, but now on the nuts and bolts of like, you know, what advice would I give you? whatever you're doing you got to do more of it if you dropped five songs you got to drop 50 songs if you drop 10 songs you should be dropping 100 songs and that comes from focus and so your stuff might suck like at the beginning everybody's stuff so i love that video of kanye talking about like my beats sucked at first you know and then however many years later everyone on the whole industry wanted to buy his beats they were the best beats in the game but at first they suck you just have to really stick to it and high output high volume will lead to your craft being refined. You're not just going to make the best shit like the first time. You might have to drop 10 albums, 20, whatever it takes, but you have to do things in volume. Like people think they're going to make that one hit. And every once in a while you find an artist that gets lucky and they make that one hit. Maybe they're extremely talented, maybe certain circumstances. Luck is a part of it. You know, sometimes people get lucky and that's great. But if you make a hundred songs, 200 songs, you're going to get good. You know, so high volume is, is a part of it for sure. Right. And, and would you say another aspect of that would be to not worry about it being absolutely perfect? Like it's never going to be absolutely perfect. So you just have to release the track because there's so many incredible producers that really fixate on making it absolutely perfect. And in some cases they're mm -hmm. sitting on tracks for like years waiting for it to be absolutely perfect, not realizing it's never going to be absolutely perfect. So just yeah. release it. What are your thoughts about that? I'm one of those guys. I got a bunch of tracks on my hard drive. I'm like, man, what if I would, this song's been here for four years on my hard drive. What if I would just put that out without overthinking it and over judging myself and the insecurities of like, oh, what if my audience doesn't like this and all that kind of stuff? Like, you just got to figure out how to get over yourself and just put it out and realize it's bigger than you. Um, you know, that that's definitely a big part of it for sure. Yes. I mean, that goes along with the volume because sure you can make incredible tracks. It does take time to really dial it in. It's not like you can really, yeah, it's a balance. You got to balance it out from like, it's going to be perfect to like, yo, just screw it. Just put it out. And you just find that middle ground. Like it's good enough, but then you don't be like, Oh, it's good enough. You know, it's, it's really just finding your balance and striking your balance. But this is the one thing you don't get better when you're making the track. This you get better when the track is on Spotify and you're listening back to it. That's when the progress happens because you get that like feedback loop. You're like listening to it. You're like, oh shit, I can make a way better track than this. But if it's just sitting on your hard drive, you don't get the loop doesn't get completed. You know what I mean? So it's like drop that track on Spotify. Just keep dropping them and you're going to get better with every one as opposed to just, oh, I have 10 tracks and they're all pretty good. Like that's not what advances you to that next level. Right. And then when you're dropping these tracks to think about it from the business aspect, when you're dropping these tracks, Hey, they're generating revenue for you. Even if it's just a little bit, like you keep putting yeah. these tracks out, they're on Spotify throughout these yeah. places that pay uh commission and things, you know, for streams, you're going to mm -hmm. make money. So that's, that is kind of mm -hmm. not the goal. The money is never the goal. The goal is to have a successful music career, but you have to understand that money is a part of it. So if you're sitting on these epic tracks that are going to attract people to buy them, what's the point of them being on a hard drive? When they yeah, should be out yeah, exactly. there, you know, that's something to yeah. think about. I know some, some artists like major label artists that, you know, he, he's like, Oh, my biggest hit 
was a track I didn't even like, but you know, and so it, like that was his biggest song ever. So it's a famous rapper guy. And uh, that was his most famous song. He didn't even like that song very much. So you don't know what the market is going to respond to. You don't know what people are going to connect with. And you definitely don't know unless you put it out, you know? Right. And that's really interesting because that correlates with what Josh Hernandez said last episode. He said the exact same thing. He's a professional manager. He's out with hundreds of artists and he literally had the exact same advice as you Hmm. did. It's really interesting. Just put out the music, high output, get it out there to people. What about some of the business stuff? We did kind of just touch on that. What are some of the business Mm -hmm. things that uh, newer artists or just artists in general especially in this digital world, what are some of the things that they should look out for some pitfalls or things to avoid? Um, man, if, right off the bat, it kind of comes back to what I said ago. Just don't get like distracted by the, you know, the shiny object syndrome. Oh, uh, you know, deep house producers get paid the most. Like if you love deep house, then hell yeah, go make some deep house or like, or trap music is, is the most streamed on Spotify. Well, if you don't like trap, like, why are you making music? Like, you know what I mean? Like that's a pitfall. That's the, for me, the main pitfall right now, if, when it comes to like, say, say there was no COVID, say everything was just normal and you're like out there playing shows and doing your thing, you got to watch out for the, the unhealthy lifestyle, like a hundred percent. Like I, I, I don't drink. I'm not a drinker. But so that means I can enjoy a little bit of booze here. I think tequila is almost like a magical medicine, right? But if you overuse it, obviously it's bad. So when I when I DJ, I like a little shot of tequila, maybe two, because you're up there for an hour or two. I mean, the energy kind of wakes you up, keeps you going. And so that's that's fine and dandy. I feel like there's nothing wrong with it. But if I'm doing that every single night, then it's a problem. You know what I mean? And then then, you're, then you need more and your tolerance is going up and you're drinking more tequila. And I've, I've had little runs of that, but nothing like, you know, I've never had like a major bout with drugs and alcohol or anything. I've always been pretty grounded. Thank the God, thank the gods. Thank God for that or whatever. But um, <laughs> I've seen it. I've seen it happen to myself. Like, whoa, dude, you like drank hard liquor every, because you're on tour like every night for six, seven, eight, ten, 10, whatever day. Like, that's not okay. My, like you have, or you have liver, you have kidneys. You don't want to be doing that. Like, so definitely watch out for the unhealthy lifestyle of touring and getting crappy sleep, which is just part of touring. You know, most of the time, a lot of times you're playing the after hour show at three or 4 a.m. So that's all fine and dandy. But when it becomes a lifestyle, your health is going to degrade. You know, depression can kick in for a lot of people. I mean, look at Avicii, you know, like dead at whatever young age, just from drinking too much, depression, all these kind of things. So that's a major pitfall if like, the music industry was just normal. And then you got yes men, you got people that, you know, just telling you, yes, yes, yes. Oh, we love your shit. Oh, we're going to help you make money, get your famous spot. And a lot of those people aren't your friends. They're just like some random person you met backstage. And so, so stick with, stick with your homies that you can, like people that got your back, that love you, that are in your corner, that have been in your corner. Um, that's also rare. It's not like everybody, you know, can, can, make that happen some people just don't have those people from the beginning but if you have those people from the beginning you want to keep them around because other people just latch on and then when shit ain't popping they're they're gone you know what i mean they're not there for you and i haven't had too much experiences with this but i've seen it go down i'm like whoo you know i'm pretend i'm I'm almost thankful i'd never got super famous or whatever because yeah you just see See there, there is so many hangers on and really energy vampires that don't have know how to create anything for themselves. So they <laughs> feel the only way that they can survive is by feeding off of another artist because they do oh, need yeah, help. Yeah. These artists do need help. They do need other humans to fulfill these for other sure. roles. You need a team. Yeah. There's okay. No and that'll doubt. be the third part. I, I should have been better at building a team when I was at the height of my success. It's because I had people booking for me that were working really hard that were focused that weren't party animals you know what i mean so if the if you can have a solid team that's really working you have an artist and you need capital you need income if you're like this broke artist that's fine for a little bit but if you don't have capital you're building a business essentially if that's your goal anyway if that's your goal and what you're doing to build be a touring dj you're building a business so you need capital for that there's plenty of times where i didn't have enough money to make merch and make whatever and i if i would have did that things would have moved a little bit better or had money to travel to this gig so so that would be i say watch out for the unhealthy lifestyle um, and watch out for unhealthy people that latch on and have a good team. They're kind of the same thing and understand that you're running a business. And if you got to go work a job or even like I would have told myself my past, I'll take a year or two off, work a freaking job, make your music when you get off and save up money and build up capital and do it properly. You know, 
Yeah, and then have control over your life because you have the resources to do the things to advance your career. Yeah, exactly. And you should, you know, mostly eat healthy when you can. I know it's hard when you're on the road. You're you're going to these it places. Is. It's really a lot of these supermarkets aren't open late. You get into town late. It's just then you're eating bar food. But just try your best to really be healthy. Try to get that exercise. And that's when it's going to maintain the longevity. Um, yep, yep. Well, dude, I really want to thank you for being on the podcast. It's been <laughs> super duper awesome. Definitely, bro. And it's been you know, a while. It's uh, you'll be back. I'm sure. You know, we'll keep these uh, appearances going because it's it's really enlightening. Nice. It's not just the you know perspective of being a musician that's been in the underground electronic music scene for over two decades and just being there with us. It's really just being a cosmic, spiritual, enlightened human, a loving human. And having that, deep, that, yeah, and having that deep perspective there. So you have a lot of value. <laughs> There's a lot that try, you try can to contribute to sure. the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's also the thing. Don't play yourself down. You know what I mean? Because we're humans, oh, we play ourselves down, but there's so much good we can give. And when you focus on giving and you're focusing on contributing to other people's like whatever happiness, success, well-being, health, that that comes back to you like through the ethers of the universe, you know, don't oh, worry yeah. about like, Oh, I did this for this person. and I need to get paid back. Like sometimes, yeah, that's, you know, it's a transaction, but most of the time, just, just the more you give out to the universe, it will come back and you'll feel better about yourself and you'll be a happier person when you're contributing. Well, you know, just sneak preview. We next yeah. episode after your episode is going to be a wonderful woman. Her name is boom Shika. And she has a <laughs> podcast called the millionaire hippie. And we had an incredible mm. conversation about abundance and prosperity consciousness. And she has an incredible story. We talk about all those things. You're going to have to tune in. Dope. Dope. I love that. So before we go, you know, we still have a few more minutes. We can hang out. We're going to talk about yeah, what cool. you have available. Cool. We're going to We're talk here. about your sample pack. Actually, let's just go into that. Let's before, before we say your final words, I do want to tell everyone that you just released this incredible incredible sample pack called ridiculous drums can we talk about that a little uh, yeah. bit yeah sure sure and even just to um cap that a few weeks ago i before that i put out my cloud wrap template so it's kind of like an ableton template when you just load it up and you can just it's more for not only beginners but if you're just like brand new at ableton and you're like i just got ableton i have no idea what to do like you just open up this template and kind of start jamming and kind of feeling it out so uh oh i'm just realizing my computer battery one sec oh no i didn't realize it wasn't plugged in this whole time oh no but, no um, worries so, yeah so thanks for mentioning all that so um that's, yeah, tell that's me about the side goal tell me about the ridiculous drums like what's in it what's appealing <laughs> to these producers that are out there it's some, it's some nice drums. I call it the lo-fi trap sample pack because it's some lo-fi sounds, a lot of melody loops, um, you know, classic trap drums. But, you know, I have my own spin on it. So a lot of lo-fi, low fidelity. And some of the drums slap pretty hard, 808s, just the classic stuff, a lot of loops. So you can just throw in some loops and get to work. Um, I really want to, I mean, a big part of like my just thing as a human is, you know, I'm a teacher and i don't say i'm this teacher but you know like i teach music production at this school in la called garnish music production and i teach private lessons i help people produce albums so i love to learn and i love to share and experience so part of my thing is just helping other people with their process of creating music um it's just it's like natural it's not something i have to try to do right so yeah the sample packs kind of play into that where i can create these sound packs and people can load them up and use them in creating their own music and just getting busy with that Hell yeah. so yeah the, the template is like i just got ableton square one what and it's cloud wrapped which is kind of kind of chill it's a you know aka chill trap same type of thing that kind of like mellow trap beats with real floaty chords and kind of slower tempo slower tempos and heavy bass 808s and um and so the the trap sample pack the ridiculous drums that's like you know the next version that's just like a lot of like said loops but that's not a template those are just straight samples and yeah i'm stoked i put a lot of time into it and i'm using it for all my own music and i'm not plugging that like because you know we all like to download sample packs and stuff I'm like well sure i can make this sample pack and, you know, it would be nice to sell some. I mean, some guys make a lot of money selling their sample packs. That's great. I wouldn't, wouldn't mind that. But um, it's like it, it enhances my own my own tracks, too. I'm using it in my own music, and it's working out great. Yeah, for sure. I was going to say, sounds. if people 
don't think they're ridiculous. Can they get their money back? If, if it's, it's yeah, like, sure, if, it, if sure. it's like I'll not just ridiculous, you. it was like, um, it was like stupendous, but like, didn't really go to ridiculous. <laughs> it was, you're like, well, it's ludicrous. Like that's, I don't know where that yeah, falls in go. the spectrum. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. You know, I'd give someone their money back. No, I'm sure, just kidding. Sure. No, no. What, you know, <laughs> fine. All sales are final at NicoLuminous.com. No, we're going to talk about that in just a second, but I want you to leave our audience, our worldwide audience, um, all these, all these amazing people, this growing audience, what's something that you want to tell people that could inspire them? Something that you want to leave people with before we go? Hmm. Um, I mean, it's my recurring theme in life to like stick with, you know, what really calls you. Cause if you don't do that, time's going to go by and you don't want the, what if I was like, what if I did that? And I can say that from experience. Like there's plenty of time. We all probably have that. Like, Oh, what if I would have did this? I mean, I remember when you first told me about Bitcoin many, 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 many years ago. And nope. I was like, what, what is it? It was like a dollar 20 cent. It was something ridiculous. And I was just like, nah, whatever. Just blew it off. And so now I think like, wow, what if I would have bought a hundred dollars of Bitcoin back in right at the very beginning. And so anyway, you don't want, and that's just a, that's kind of an offshoot of a scenario, but I'm saying with, with your creation and what you're doing in life, like investments is a whole nother conversation, but just, you don't want to be like, what if I would have did this and I never did just do it and see what happens. You know, you're going to feel better about yourself. And so if you are like, Oh, I don't have enough time. You probably have a lot more time than you realize, but you need to focus. You can, you can get a lot done in 10 minutes. You know what I mean? If you focus, you can get a lot done in an hour or two hours if you really focus. Um, one thing I'd like to do is regularly delete Instagram off my phone. I don't have Facebook on my phone at all. Like I've never had Facebook on my phone, maybe in like the beginning 2008 or nine, but um, I, I, and I'm not saying I don't use my phone to get on my phone just as much as the next human. But um, if you just delete the app, guess what? You don't look at it 10 times a day. And then, you know, put it on a few days later. Like you can, I, so I, I'll put Instagram on my phone like twice a week, two times, three times a week. And then I'll, then I'll take it off for a day or two, two or three days. So and that just comes back to focus and maximizing your time. Like you can get back so much time. If you focus, don't, don't let shit throw you off your center. You know, we're humans. I'm not saying that that's not going to happen. Um, but the more you can like stay locked in and, and get done what you want to do, you'll probably get more out of your life. You know, if you can just focus on what you really want to accomplish and write shit down. I like to have like a, I have it. Here's one, an old one. Okay. I just do these like legal pads. And, um, you know, I can look at like Saturday, October 12th, 2019. I had to do so and so, and then I ch chop them over. So I like to track my progress. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's a big deal. And then so now as the years go by, I can be like, oh, like I said, 2019, shit, that was almost two years ago, you know? And so tracking your progress is a big deal because when you write something down with an actual physical pen, paper and you write it down and then you're staring at you have when you cross it off it feels so good right it's an amazing for me personally it's an amazing feeling so when that becomes a habit then you start seeing progress and you can look back on your old logs of, of progress and like oh shit i did that i did that and better than wondering like oh what if i would have did that random idea just write it down and sometimes it's a crappy idea and you don't have to do it but it's when you write it down and looking at it you can you know actually figure it out well, hell yeah, brother. That's an incredible thought to leave people with. I want people to focus on that. And if you want nice. to know more about Nico Luminous, you want to know what he's about. He's an incredible dude. I love the guy to death. NicoLuminous.com. N-I-C-O. I'm going to spell it out for people. N-I-C-O. Nico. N-I-C-O. Luminous. The word luminous. L-U-M-I-N-O-U-S.com. Yep. And then yep. my Instagram's Nico underscore luminous on Instagram. Right. And you have a shop there from Epic Gear. You have shirts. You have all this incredible stuff. Like you said, you have a sample pack that was just released. Ridiculous drums, it's called. And and the other one. Um, and you, all the music. Oh, the cloud wrap template. Cloud yeah, wrap I have template, a few yes. on there. Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. all the music, all your music's available for purchase and stream, of course. At yeah, just Spotify, go on Spotify. You got an Apple, account. Yeah. yeah Apple. Title, whatever you like. I know you love Title. Which is actually, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I just said I love Title because it pays the artists way more. Well, but unfortunately, that's the critical mass is not on Title. So there's a new kid in town, and it's oh. Cubaz, <laughs> and Cubaz okay. actually pays like eight times as much as Title, and it turns wow. out Title hasn't actually been paying 
the bill <laughs> and they're about to go bankrupt. So everybody oh, out man. there, I used to endorse title and because I love lossless music, I love fidelity. We talk about music and fidelity on this very podcast, actually. Now it's Q boss. They're from France. Incredible company. Okay. The only company that's truly streaming lossless and not only 16 bit lossless. They're the only company that nice. streams true 24 bit lossless flack so and they pay their bills unlike title dope dope yeah. well there you go yeah don't stream my stuff on title <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well thank you so much brother i'm going to go ahead and hit the outro music please stay on the line we're going to talk a little bit more everybody yeah bro that was fun we'll see you next week 